Hey guys, Taki here. This took a lot longer than I thought, but we are finally going to take a look at the new Lenovo Legion Go. I originally tried to get this as a reviewer unit a couple of months ago, but this company is impossible to work with. There are just way too many cooks in the kitchen with these guys and just as many people that don't do the job that they have the title for. But whatever, I can always buy a retail unit to review. And now if something is bad with Go, I don't have to feel like I have to dance around it to protect a relationship. That being said, I am a huge Lenovo fan with a lot of products that I paid for with my own money, so I'm hoping that this one doesn't suck. There are practical reasons to want to get a review unit of a device that is sold internationally and in China. The biggest reason is to not have to deal with the China home version of Windows, which is the worst version of Windows possible since you cannot change the display language. And even though I can use the device like this, I don't want to, especially not when I'm paying the full price that this goes for in the US for an inferior version of Windows. So now I'm gonna go through the same thing that I had to do with Ally by going through the process of wiping this drive, installing the standard version of Windows, and then reinstalling all of the Lenovo apps and drivers, which I hope is an easy process. Through the magic of editing, I have finished that process. I now have a real version of Windows on this, and I've gone through the process of getting all of the software reinstalled. For whatever reason, Lenovo doesn't give you the option of downloading the Lenovo Legion Space application on the support page, and that's the most important thing to get. I had to get this from Reddit of all places, which doesn't make a lot of sense. The only other issue that I found is that the charging speed is crap on this and I have no idea why. To demonstrate what I mean, let's start by looking at Battery Mon. I'm doing this with two cables. With the first one connected, I am reading a charge rate of around 40 watts. This is good, but this usually sits at three watts. I also tested the bottom port and the charging speed is the same. If we do the same thing with the official cable, it's a bit better, but not by much, and both ports are the same. Now let's boot into a game and you will watch that charge rate drop to the floor. With the game fully loaded, you can see that we are charging at around three watts. But maybe this is an issue with this charger, so let's go back to the stock charger to see if it changes. And it doesn't. I thought this was because the device was pulling too much power, so I capped the TDP at 10 watts, but nothing changes. I have no idea why this is happening, but this is the biggest issue that I found out of the box, and this issue existed before I wiped the device. I have to emphasize that. This is an out of the box issue. But anyway, in this first section, let's go over the controls, layout, and ergonomics. For those of you guys that don't know, one of the original ideas for the first iNeo device was to have detachable controllers like Go, but they canned it and went with this design. When I look at both of these, it seems intentional that they look this similar. I don't think this was a coincidence at all. There are some things that this one does better than this, but there are way more that the Lenovo Legion Go does better than this first Aya device. But yeah, on the front of Go, we have two analog sticks, and these are the same size components that you'll find in Ally and I do think that they're good. They're not as good as the bigger ones used in the Steam Deck, but they are better than Switch joysticks. Lenovo also did a better job with the material that they used around the joysticks, so this shouldn't suffer from grinding as easily as other handhelds. We have two buttons on the top of the Lenovo Legion Go that you can use to interact with the software that this comes with. Underneath the right button, we have a set of input buttons that use conductive rubber. These are decently sized buttons with a good amount of travel to them. The D-pad is a bit different. This guy uses dome switches and the entire button is on the shallow side. This one reminds me of something like a big SP or a 3DS D-pad. It's not bad, but I don't think it's what a lot of people were hoping for. Underneath that, we have start and select and I kind of find that these are in an awkward position. The right side has a trackpad and this thing is very useful for interacting with the system and I like that it's a full square to make it easier to use. On the top of Go, we have a big set of shoulder buttons. R1 and L1 are really chunky and these use micro switches that aren't that loud. They are clicky, but I like them. L2 and R2 are also nice and these kind of remind me of the ones that are in the Steam Deck, both in their size and in feel. We don't have a lot in the main portion of this, but there are some things that I wish they would have done. We have big volume buttons on the left side with one of our speakers. Near that, you'll find a Type-C port, an SD card slot, a fan exhaust, another speaker, a headphone jack, and a power button. Now, not every device needs a ton of USB ports, but I find it kind of lacking that this device only has one on the top and one on the bottom in an awkward position. Right now, if I wanted to charge this, then I can just, you know, connect this cable to the top and then it's fine. But if I wanted to use anything else and it's standing up like this, then I would have to connect it to a dock. But I would not need to do that if they had a second port on the top. 
but this isn't the only handheld that only has one port on the top, so at least we do have two overall. There's nothing on the bottom of Go besides a single USB port on the far end. The back has a few interesting things that I want to talk about, and while we're here, I'll point out that this thing is kind of a fingerprint magnet, but it does clean up well. It would have been better if they would have went with a texture or paint that rejects prints better than this. Both of the controllers have back buttons like the deck, but the right controller uses a different layout. I like the arrangement that they went with on the left controller more. These are big clicky buttons that are easy to press. The interesting thing about this device is that the controllers come off. If you press this switch on the bottom, you can then push these down to get them off. It's not as easy to do as it is on the Switch, but I don't think they could have gone with that style if they wanted. With both controllers off, you basically have a big Windows tablet with a kickstand. This kickstand is amazing. It's huge just like on the OLED Switch, and it works really well. If I put this on my desk to game with and I have the controllers connected, I don't have any stability issues. But unlike other Windows tablets, this thing is thick. But now it's a good time to show you what I meant about the D-pad being too short. It would have been cool to see a bit more height to this part or a conductive rubber pad, but I think this is way better than if they would have gone with a circle D-pad like others have tried. This one is at least passable. The right controller has a bit more going on with it. We have two extra buttons on the side here, along with another one that's connected to the R1 button. These are going to come in handy when we check out the FPS mode that this has. You can activate this mode by flipping a switch on the bottom, but now that I'm looking at this closely on camera, it's kind of crazy how much damage is already on this part because I haven't used it yet. But yeah, the cool thing about this entire handheld is that we can use this as a mouse in a pinch. I just want to add that after I filmed that last part, I reconnected the controllers to finish up this section and the device hard crashed. That's the second time that this has happened to me doing the same thing. I don't know what's going on with that, but I wanted to mention it here. When it comes to the ergonomics, I think this device feels pretty good in the hands. It's a big device, but the back grips are very comfortable in the hand, but this edge right here is kind of sharp. They really should have rounded this off a bit more like it is on that INEO device. That would feel much better than this. I find that the controller digs into my palm a bit when I'm holding this in my hand and it's not great. It's so strange that it's like this because the rest of this feels like it is how it was always meant to be, but this edge sticks out as a pain point. Other than that, this doesn't feel too heavy. All of the controls are easy to get to with a small movement, like most of the games you're going to play you're only going to need to do something like this, and this doesn't feel straining. But this kind of movement right here doesn't feel great. Maybe it would have been better to have these on the top to take the place of those Legion space buttons. When it comes to the trackpad, this one doesn't give me any issues when I need to use it for some quick tasks. When you use it, you'll feel some slight vibration to improve the tactile feeling. I'm planning to do a lot of screen tests and comparisons against other handhelds in my full review, but I did just want to give like my first impressions on this screen from the short time that I've had with it thus far. I think this is a pretty decent screen. If we just ignore the small shortcoming that this has about being a portrait panel, it's a good screen. It's not the best big screen that I've seen in a handheld, but it is pretty good. It also has the benefit of being a 144Hz panel. It is a bit disappointing that it's not a VRR panel like the one in Ally because that would have been awesome. The original leaked marketing material said that this was a VRR panel and I was so hyped about that but then they took it away. I don't know if this was done for technical reasons or if there was some licensing issue that they didn't want to deal with but it is disappointing. I picked this game in particular because it has a lot of colors that pop on good screens. Everything in this looks great to my eyes, and the brightness is also very good. This is not the highest brightness that is possible on this. If I open up the controller menu, we are at a bit under 100%. If I turn this all the way up, we get a small boost. Now, they say this is a 500 nits panel, and I'm inclined to believe them. It might even turn out that they undershot that a bit. When it comes to the minimum brightness level, that also seems good, but I don't think I would use this device at night in the same way that I've talked about using other handhelds. In my opinion, this is a panel that is best suited for doing some proper media consumption or gaming because it looks very good. The only thing that is less than ideal is that it doesn't look that great in darker games when you view the screen from the side. So if you're going to play this with a couple of people sitting on both sides of you, it would not look good to them, but it is serviceable. I also was not able to see any significant light bleeding on the unit that I bought. This is a pure black screen with the ISO cranked way up on my camera. To the naked eye, I can't see anything. This next section is all about software, and this is not going to be a big one because there's quite frankly not a whole lot going on here in terms of software. You're going to be interacting with the software that this uses by using either of those buttons on the top. I'll start by going over the main one first. With a single press of the left button, 
Legion Space will launch if it wasn't already loaded in the background. Your device might look different than this because this seems to be populated with region-specific content based on your IP address. I don't know if this would change if I connected to a VPN and started this up, but this is how it looks to me. They should have an option for the user to set their region, preferably without having to log in. This main menu has a couple of sections that I haven't bothered with yet, including the cloud gaming section and the store. The library feature is decent on this, but other launchers do this much better. The Android game section is a bit strange to find on this device. It seems to be based on whatever Tencent uses for their PUBG client. You should be able to install any apps that you want on this, but I don't think that I would use something like this to play Android games. If we go into the settings menu and then go down to performance, we have TDP controls that are a bit easier to configure than on something like Ally, where you have three different TDP values that you can control. The problem is that the custom setting doesn't seem to work at all based on my testing. Even if I set this to something like 5 watt TDP, it will rocket up to 30 watt TDP and stay there. Because of that, I find myself using the built-in profile options or external controls that actually work. In the controller section, you have a few things that you can do here. You can remap some of the buttons to other things, but there is a lot of work that still needs to be done. This is bare bones compared to the configuration that we can do on other devices that this competes with. Beyond button remapping options that we don't have, we also don't have any control over the dead zones of this device. Now these don't seem to be that bad by default, but they could be better. As you can see, I can press this a lot before it goes to the next menu item. If you single press the right menu, for some reason they've decided to map two menus to this button. This one is not useful at all, so I wish that I could just like burn this and just have the right menu all of the time. Occasionally, I'll come in here to do some brightness adjustments while I'm in a game, and then I'll close it. If I want to do that same thing again, I've got to press this once again, open a menu that I don't need, press it again to close that menu, and then press it again to open up the one that I actually want. This just seems so stupid, I don't know why they went with this. This right menu has quick actions for resolution options and refresh rate settings, but you also have quick actions to performance modes. But again, I would like to see a lot more done here. This is very bare bones. And I don't know what I expected, but I thought things would be different when these bigger companies came into the market. I thought we would see awesome software on the Windows side to compete with Valve, but that has not happened. There is a lot more that Lenovo can do here to make this experience more novice friendly, especially if they want to grow their market share in this niche. Before we go into the gameplay section, I want to just talk about thermals. I'm going to have a lot more to say about thermals in my full review, along with some thermal imaging tests of this and comparisons against other devices. But I just want to go over my first impressions after using this for a couple of hours. Now, unfortunately, we don't have custom fan control on this like we do on some of the niche devices that this competes with and on the ROG Ally. The only control that you really have is you can set the fan to full speed or you can just leave it on auto. And you should expect that this thing is going to get pretty loud on the high end because we only have one fan and it is a smaller one. Right now I have this on the quiet profile and you can see that we're at 8 watt TDP. This is not enough to be able to run this game, but it doesn't really matter. I'm going to switch to another mode in just a second. Right now my microphone is off to the left side of the screen, so it's pretty far away from where the fan is. The fan exhaust is over here on the top, so this is not in the direct line of sight of the fan exhaust. So this is kind of like the best case scenario. This is almost where your head would be if you were playing this yourself. And if we just listen to the ambient noise, You can hear it, it's not bad. It is probably comparable to what the Steam Deck would be at this TDP level. Maybe the Steam Deck would be a bit better, but it's not that far. But again, we don't have enough power to be able to play that game at the resolution that I'm using. So let's go ahead and change the performance profile. If I open up that left menu and then go down to the thermal mode, you can see that I'm on the quiet profile. This is gonna be good enough for some retro games, but it's not good enough for the game that I'm playing right here. Let's go over to the balance profile. Now here we are with the balance profile, and this is gonna leave us with a 15 watt sustained boost. That seems to be what we're working with. It started off at 25 watt, but it went down to 15. At this level, the fan isn't bad. It is louder. If I go silent right now, you'll hear that there is more background noise. But again, it's not that bad. I think this is probably close to what the Steam Deck would be. This might be a bit quieter. I don't have them side by side right now, but it doesn't seem like it's excessive by any stretch of the imagination. And with 15 watt TDP, you're gonna be able to play a lot of games, but you won't be able to play 
bigger games that are going to be running at 1200p or even the native resolution of this panel. But 800p, you're going to be able to get by with a lot of games and the fan noise isn't going to be anything that you're going to have to worry about. The problem starts to happen when we go up higher than this. But here we are with the performance profile. This started out at 30 watt TDP, but it's slowly gone down. I think it's gonna settle around 22 watt TDP, which is perfectly fine for this processor. At this TDP, I am able to fully play this game above 60 FPS, even in combat, so that's great for me. The fan is a bit louder than it was with the last profile, but it's still not that bad. At this level, I think it is above the loudest that the Steam Deck can get. Now the benefit about this big size is that I can't feel any of that heat. You can see the CPU is at 66 Celsius right now, but my hands are so far removed from where that heat is that I can't feel any of it. If I were to extend my fingers out on the back of the device so I can touch the center unit, I can feel some warmth on my left hand, but it's not that bad. There's basically nothing on my right hand. There are other devices on the market that have this processor that use bigger fans, but those are also on smaller devices where your hands will be coming in contact with that heat so you notice that the device is warmer. I don't notice it here. The only thing that I can notice is that the fan is louder. Now the good thing about this is they seem to have over-tuned the fan speed for this TDP level. I would be fine with a 75 Celsius CPU temp at this TDP level if it meant the fan was going to be quieter. And the good thing is, even with that higher CPU temp, I'm not going to feel it because my hands are so far away from the heat generating source on this device. That kind of makes me hopeful that we will get custom fan control with a future software update. And if that happens, then I think that's going to make this device a lot better because right now, I think fan noise is going to be the only thing that people will have issue with on this device. Like, there are some things that could be better but the fan noise is the one that is the most noticeable. And I always think that it's better to give that kind of choice to the user over whether or not they would want a warmer device that is quiet or a louder one that is cooler. Our final performance level is with the custom profile and this taps out at 30 watt TDP, but I bet I could use external tools to get this to go higher. At this level, the fan is super loud and I do not think that I would use this setting at all unless I had headphones on. The problem is this is the TDP range that you're going to need to use if you want to play games at the native resolution of this panel. Custom fan control could help out a bit, but we're already pretty high at 72 Celsius with the fan on max. And if I'm quiet right now, you can hear that the fan is very loud. The only thing that I want to point out is that the speakers do appear to be able to mask some of the fan noise when the TDP is cranked pretty high if you have the volume set to max. Here's what it sounds with the volume at max with the performance profile. So it's not that bad. Now it's finally time to go over the FPS mode. This has a slight learning curve to it to get used to treating this as a mouse, but it does work and I'm very impressed. They have a few profiles to choose from with different button mappings for controls, but again, they could do a lot more here. I am currently playing through a viewfinder, so this could be better with more practice and a better view of the screen, but I like it. It is an interesting take on a problem that all of these handhelds have, and it gives purpose to having detachable controllers. I don't think that this is a mouse and keyboard replacement. I see this as a decent augmentation that you can use if you want to travel lighter while also getting most of the benefits that you can get with a mouse in games that need it. It's not without issues. There were some points during filming where the controllers went to sleep and I needed to reattach them to the main unit to get them to work again. I would assume there's a better way to do this, but I couldn't wake them up on my own. I also had times where the controller would go into gamepad mode on its own and then go back to FPS mode, but that one wasn't that common. But after some more time, I'm on board with using the right controller as a decent alternative to a mouse, but the left one isn't there for me at this point as a replacement for a keyboard. It works best in games that don't have a ton of keyboard bindings, but that's if one of the controller profiles works for you. I would much rather go with a small keyboard that's easier to travel with, and Lenovo makes a great one that's worth every dollar, and then use the right controller in FPS mode. That is a great combination. Before going into my final thoughts for this impressions video, let's jump into some gameplay tests. For these titles, I targeted 1200p with the performance profile. There's a lot more that can be done here to min-max things on the Lenovo Legion Go, but I'll save that for the main review. The first title that we're looking at is Turbo Overkill at 1200p, low settings. The 
next game is a vibrant title that looks great on this display. This is Windbound at 1200p, low settings. This is a smaller title, but it's very demanding if you have a big house with a big farm. Here's Core Keeper at 1200p medium settings. And for this video, I also wanted to get some titles that could run at a higher frame rate so I could evaluate the screen. This one is easier to run at 144 FPS and it runs great on the Legion Go. This is Halls of Torment at 1200p. Our last title for this section is Star Wars Squadrons at 1200p, low settings. But yeah, I want to wrap up this video by going over some of the main points of feedback that I have after using this device for the last day or so. I think the first thing that I can say is this is a much better device than I thought it was going to be. The controls are largely really good on this. The joysticks are awesome. The D-pad isn't that bad. The ADXY buttons are good. And the triggers are also really good. I was not expecting any of those to be that good. And that's not because this is a company that is more known for making laptops and other products like that. I am basing this solely on the other handheld that they made that they didn't release. If you guys weren't aware, I did a video on the Lenovo Legion Play not that long ago, and there are a few things that this thing does better than the Lenovo Legion Go, but none of them are the controls. Both the devices share the same analog sticks, but the D-pad and the ABXY buttons are much worse on the Play than they are on the Go. These are pretty good controls. There are a few things that are kind of like a toss-up. I think the speakers are probably better on the Play than they are on the Go, but like everything else is better on Go than it is on this unreleased handheld. So in that regard, they have exceeded my expectations because this is a huge jump to make from the Play to the Go. The next standout thing for me is the screen. It's not the best big screen that I've seen, but we do have a lot of bad screens on the market right now in handhelds that are larger, and this one is very good. The brightness is good, the colors are good, and the rendered image was relatively sharp for all of the games that I filmed in this video. The last cool thing that I like about this device based on my time so far with it is that FPS mode. That is a really interesting new addition to this handheld scene that we haven't seen before, and it is commendable that they went that route because we don't really see that much innovation in the handheld market. A lot of these devices are almost the same with just a different shell and a different coat of paint, but that is a cool new feature that is more than just a gimmick. Now on the other side of this coin, there are some things that need to be addressed going forward. The charging issue on this is really a non-starter for me. It took me 10 hours to charge this with the official charger, which is just ridiculous. I've also experienced crashing issues. I think this has crashed five times since I opened up out of the box and not all of them happened doing the same thing. I had two crashes when I reconnected the controllers and I had a couple of other crashes waking this up from sleep. Beyond that, we also have some software issues that need to be hammered out with the stock software that comes with this. The custom TDP mode just doesn't work at all right now and there are a lot of other things that they could do to make this device better. The biggest one of them is custom fan controls. The fan is really the only thing that I don't like about this device based on my time with it thus far and I think they could do some things to make that a bit better. The easiest one that they could do would just be to give us custom fan controls so that way we can determine how much fan noise is acceptable to us. Now this entire video is mainly focused on the Lenovo Legion Go but there are devices that have better sounding fans than this just as there are devices that have worse sounding fans than this. That is the only pain point that I have in an otherwise decent device. I'll have a full review in the next few days that'll delve deeper into to a lot of things that I would like to know if I were going to buy this device as a consumer. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see another, take a look at the video that I did on the unreleased Lenovo Legion Play. Happy gaming everyone, Taki out.